I've titled my sermon today, Feeding on Ashes. Uh, it's kind of an interesting statement made in the scripture, and it's talking about the idol makers. And how strange it is that someone can carve a piece of wood and take a little bit of that wood and cook their breakfast, and then to take what's left over to carve an idol. But it just talks about how it's, you know, the NLT used the word stupid, ignorant. You know, and uh, you know, don't they realize they're feeding on ashes? And and I think really the message today uh, is going to be around that topic, right? The difference between uh, feeding on ashes and actually feeding on something of substance. And uh, this week, I'm sure as, as a lot of you that are on the internet, you, you see these funny memes and people post all sorts of things. And and I like God, so I think that kind of puts me into the category where they feed me fun things about dogs. And, and this gentleman was sharing about how he had just bought this new treat for his dog. And he, he has the camera pointing at this nice, it looked like a, a rawhide tree. And the dog is just looking at him, not touching the tree. And then he pans to his tub of chicken nuggets that the dog is more interested in. And, and I think that's kind of the, the concept this morning. You know, this might look pretty yummy to a dog, but we know better, right? We know that there are better things to, uh, to chew on. And that dog seemed to get it, but uh, we live in a world, I think, that a lot of people, in a sense, are on autopilot. They are functioning at a level that has more to do with basic instinct, rather than a, a higher plane of thinking that, hey, there's something to this world that goes beyond the basic. Maybe I'm missing out. And I think that's what God is trying to reveal in chapter 44. He's, he's bringing it back to this idea of, you know, why would you want to feed on ashes when really you can have the benefits of knowing and, and, and uh, receiving from me. So we're going to read chapter 44, if you can open your Bibles. Chapter 44 in Isaiah. And then we'll open up in a, in a word of prayer because... You know, we take the teaching of God's Word very serious. We don't want to just treat it as something we got to get through. But uh, there is a lot here, and that we don't want to miss how God wants to speak to us specifically. Wow, looking in my Bible, I usually print it out. That's a lot of verses. I hope you guys are okay. Everyone awake? Do some jump jacks midway through, maybe not? All right. God's Word is awesome. Let's face it. So here, uh, chapter 44, verse 1. But now, listen to me, Jacob, my servant, Israel, my chosen one. The Lord who made you and helps you says, Don't be afraid, O Jacob, my servant, O dear Israel, my chosen one. For I will pour out water to quench your thirst and to irrigate your parched fields. I will pour out my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your children. They will thrive like watered grass, like willows on a riverbank. Some will proudly claim, I belong to the Lord. Others will say, I am a descendant of Jacob. Some will write the Lord's name on their hands and will take the name of Israel as their own. This is what the Lord says. Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord of Heaven's armies. I am the first and the last. There is no other God. Who is like me? Let him step forward and prove to you his power. Let him do as I have done since the ancient times when I established a people and explained its future. Do not tremble. Do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim my purpose for you long ago. You are my witnesses. Is there any other God? No. There is no other rock, not one. How foolish are those who manufacture idols. These prized objects are really worthless. The people who worship idols don't know this, so they are all put to shame. Who but a fool would make his own God an idol that cannot help him one bit? <coughs> all who worship idols will be disgraced, along with all these craftsmen, mere humans, who claim they can make a God. They may all stand together, 
that they will stand in terror and shame. The blacksmith, excuse me, blacksmith stands at his forge to make a sharp tool, pounding and shaping it with all his might. His work makes him hungry and weak. It makes him thirsty and faint. And then the woodcarver measures a block of wood and draws a pattern on it. And he works with chisel and plane and carves it into a human figure. He gives it human beauty and puts it in a little shrine. He cuts down cedars. He selects the cypress and the oak. He plants the pine in the forest to be nourished by the rain. And then he uses part of the wood to make a fire. With it, he warms himself and bakes his bread. And yes, it's true. He takes the rest of it and makes himself a god to worship. He makes an idol and bows down in front of it. He burns part of the tree to roast his meat and to keep himself warm. And he says, ah, that fire feels good. And he takes what's left and he makes his god. A carved idol. He falls down in front of it, worshiping and praying to it. Rescue me, he says. You are my god. Such stupidity and ignorance. Their eyes are closed and they cannot see. Their minds are shut and they cannot think. The person who made the idol never stops to reflect. Why is it just, it's just a block of wood. I burned half of it for heat and used it to make my bread and roast my meat. How can the rest of it be a god? Should I bow down to worship a piece of wood? The poor deluded fool feel, feeds on ashes. He trusts something that can't help him at all. Yet, he cannot bring himself to ask, is this idol that I'm holding in my hand a lie? Pay attention, O Jacob, for you are my servant, O Israel. I, the Lord, made you, and I will not forget you. I have swept away your sins like a cloud. I have scattered your offenses like the morning mist. Oh, return to me. For I have paid the price to set you free. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done this wonderful thing. Shout for joy, O depths of the earth. Break into song, O mountains and forests and every tree. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and is glorified in Israel. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer and Creator. I am the Lord who made all things. I alone stretched out the heavens. Who was with me when I made the earth? I exposed the false prophets as liars and make fools of fortune tellers. I caused the wise to give bad advice, thus proving them to be fools. But I carry out the predictions of my prophets. By them I say to Jerusalem, people will live here again and to the towns of Judah you will be rebuilt. I will restore all your ruins. When I speak to the rivers and say dry up, they will dry up. And when I say of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, he will certainly do as I say. He will command, rebuild Jerusalem. He will say, restore the temple. Wow, God's word, it is uh, powerful. Lot said there. We're going to break it down and uh, share with you, and hopefully you can take it away. Maybe the sheet will help you to remember some points that, that really you need to reflect on. But let's take a moment and pray. Lord, I just read a lot of scripture, and there's always the danger that we get lost in it all. But we're taking this moment just to pause and just to recapture our attention. And Your word is so powerful, so active, and we need it. So don't let us miss what you have for us today. Help our minds stay clear of the distractions, the things that should be lower on our priority than knowing and following your will. So we pray for that, uh, that type of attention we need in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, all right. Well, uh, <clears throat> here we are. There's a lot that's been said. And hopefully you're, you're getting a sense of why I want to talk about such things. And I think uh, the main idea, that's in green on your Explorer sheet, that's the most important thing I think we can take away from today, is, is you're never going to wake up 
if you think that just existing is the best life has to offer. Isn't that the case, really? People are not going to embrace Christ. They're not going to make a change, of course, if they think that the life they are currently living is the best that they can have. They've got to get to a moment where they consider, maybe I'm missing something. You're never going to wake up if you think that just existing is the best life has to offer. And there are many who are just existing. I think uh, for them to not know that there's a God that loves them, a God that wants to have a place in their lives, is to miss out. Amen? Amen. To not know the Lord, to not be in relationship with your Creator, is to miss out on the best thing this life has to offer. And I think it makes sense that uh, this chapter begins where, where God is speaking to Israel through the, you know, the Judah, you know, Judah and, and uh, that was exiled into Babylon. And, and uh, Isaiah is speaking to them, sharing with them the fact that despite the fact that everything is going wrong, that I'm still here. I still see you. You're special to me. So he says, but now, listen to me. Jacob, my servant. We talked about in chapter 42 about a person who was coming who would be the servant. We know full well who that is, right? That is the Lord Jesus Christ. But here he brings Jacob back to saying, you're my servant. He says, Israel, my chosen one, the Lord who made you and helps you, says, don't be afraid. O oh, Jacob, my servant, O oh, dear Israel, my chosen one. Man, isn't that a good message for us today? We live in a, a time where I think people love to stoke the fire of fear in the hearts of the population, right? Because let's face it, fear is a motivator. It can get you to vote a certain way. It can get you to use a particular medicine. It can get you to do all sorts of things. So fear is a tool that can be used in the hands of people that just want your, you know, your consumer interest. But there are things to be afraid of, right? And I think it's important uh, for us today to know that whatever it is that we're going through, God sees, He knows, He's made plans to provide for us, no matter what will come our way. And I think that's important. And I think, you know, what God is saying in verse 3, I'm going to pour out water to quench your thirst and to irrigate your parched fields. I don't think they were thinking about their gardens, right? This is metaphor. Here, God is saying that I'm willing to give you that life-producing water that your soul needs. I'm going to pour out my spirit on your descendants. And, uh, and I love that, you know, as we think about that, because we know full well when Christ came and he cleansed us through his blood, that he prepared a temple within us that God could then come and reside in. That was Pentecost, right? When Jesus told the uh, disciples, hey, go and wait for what I'm sending you. I'm going to send you the Spirit. And the Spirit could come into the lives of his people in a way that he never could prior to that because we have been prepared through the blood of Christ. But here, uh, Israel is being told that, hey, God's looking out for you. I'm going to provide for you. Uh, and he's been hinting at, prior to this, the fact that it's going to be a new path, an unfamiliar way, something that will really boggle the mind. We know that what God did by coming to earth as a man, taking upon himself the sins of the world and being crucified by sinful man, that's a change of path. That is an up upturning of what seemed to be God going in a certain direction. You know what? We couldn't keep the law of Moses. So God's change of direction was not something that happened because we had no other choice. God had planned this change of direction. And what is it that happens when we are uh, really in line with the God that loves us? We thrive. We see that in verse 4. Really, that ties into that first main point on your explore sheet. To truly know Jesus is to benefit from his care. To truly know Jesus is to benefit from his care. I'm, I'm taking this 
from an Old Testament perspective into a you know Christ and live for him now type of mentality. Because I hope you know, if you are a follower of Christ, if you've been born anew and you have the Spirit of God in you, you have a resource. You have God's resource. And those who have his resource, they're going to thrive. He says, they will thrive like watered grass, like willows on a riverbank. It's a wonderful thing to be out in the woods and to come down to a river and to see all the vegetation and the flowers. And, you know, you know that without water, things die. But when it comes to those who look to the Lord for their sustenance, God's saying, you're going to get it. You'll have everything you need. Made me think of Philippians 1. In Philippians 1, it speaks about how, hey, you know, even though you might not feel like you're there yet, I haven't given up on you. Uh, Philippians, I guess, 1.6 1, 1, says, I am certain that God, who began the good work in you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. We're all a work in progress, amen? We're all in a, a process of growth. And, and all I can say is I hope you feel that, that progress that happens. I'd love to think about those things and, and reflect on maybe how I'm doing, how I could be better. Um, what could I do that would might, you know, maybe bring me to a, a higher level of being more like Christ? God is still working on me. He's still working on you. And the word comes forth, take it easy. You have access to resources that will help you to thrive. And that should bring comfort. So in verse 7 of Philippians 1, it says, So it is right that I should feel as I do about all of you, for you have a special place in my heart. You share with me the special favor of God, both in my imprisonment and in defending and confirming the truth of the good news. Paul is relating to these Christians saying, hey, we've got the same purpose, we've got the same mission, we've got the same Lord. He who began a good work in you, he's going to continue on. And he says, God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Christ Jesus. And I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. Hey, that sounds like pretty good marching order. Should I read that again, right? Sometimes you can't put your finger on it. What am I supposed to be doing, Lord? I pray that your love will overflow more and more. How are you doing it, love, everyone? <laughs> I don't know. I kind of love myself. That's not what he's talking about. Love is, right, projecting a value onto others. Seeing People as that special creation. When you look at someone you disagree with, do you understand that God loves that person? He wants them to be in relationship with Him. You have that loving gaze towards those who that annoy you. Because you were that person once, right? I can only imagine the gazes I deserved prior to turning from my sin and, and being made new in Christ. It's pretty shameful. Sometimes I think about it. Anyone ever, like, ask for forgiveness again for something you've done in your past? Boy, you think about it, you go, what a knucklehead. I can't believe I did that. And I'll just ask God to forgive me again. I'll pray for those that were affected in the process of me making bad decisions. It's just, and it's a comfort. It's like, all right, Lord, you know that I, I understand and I am thankful for the benefit of being renewed. So where do we go from here? I guess that main question at the top of your explore sheet, how many people are existing on autopilot? And uh, I think about these things all the time, and I think, you know, philosophy and psychology, they're very interesting things to read out there. And, and there is this sense that, you know, to really live is to know thyself, to, to have a sense of a, of a conscious understanding of what makes you tick. And I think sometimes that when people aren't deep thinkers, I get carried away, but sometimes when you're not deep thinking about why you are the way you are, why you do the things you do, you kind of operate on a level that's, that's subconscious. You're kind of just existing. And I think people can get into that mode. 
unless some sort of truth is trying to pry its way in to wake you up to the fact that, you know, there's something that will take you from just existing to having life. We know that Jesus says, right, I came so that you might have life and have it to the full. There's a sense that, you know, we can operate in a, a plane of, of uh, mediocrity, plain old vanilla, never really knowing that there's so much more to life. And it begins with having a relationship with Jesus. Boy, you know, talk about understanding that, you know, this isn't very appetizing anymore. When you become born again, God starts opening your eyes to some of the delights of the Spirit working and helping you to grow. Uh, there's so many wonderful things. I love the fact that I don't have to hold the offenses of others against me. I don't have to carry unforgiveness, that Christ has shown me of a better way, that I don't live in resentment. Good to shed those things and say, you know what, people make mistakes, everybody's made mistakes, and that includes me, and I can extend forgiveness, I can extend, you know, grace towards others the way the Lord has extended grace to me. To truly know Jesus is to benefit from his care, and there's many ways, right? That second point is consider your level of identity. When I looked at verse 5 in Isaiah 44, if you want to just jump back to that if you're in Philippians, Verse 5 to me, and sometimes I almost don't want to go look at the commentaries because my own interpretation kind of speaks to me, and maybe it's wishful thinking. Maybe I'll go back and find out I was horribly wrong. But here, I think in verse 5, it's interesting to think about here, God is laying out different ways of, of identifying with God. And in my mind, I thought it was hitting on the fact that there are different levels of identification with the Lord Jesus Christ. There are levels that enter into a, a more conscious understanding of what Christ is doing, what he thinks of me, his presence in everyday life. But there are other levels of faith, right? And there's a level of faith over here where you almost forget that God's working in your life. You think there's something like chance. And you think that sometimes you stumble upon, you know, the blessings of God. And, and uh, I think it has to do with seeing yourself truly as you should be seeing yourself. So verse 5, I saw different levels of identity with the Lord. <coughs> verse 5 says, some will proudly proclaim, I belong to the Lord. And I think that's the level up here. This is where you get kind of obnoxious. You get labeled the holy roller, you know, the Bible thumper, because you just love the Lord Jesus Christ, and you know everything good about you has come from Him. So you're just, I, he, I'm His. <coughs> And then there's another level, right? It says, others will say, well, I'm a descendant of Jacob. Doesn't that seem kind of one removed? I belong to him. Well, my descendants were from Jacob, right? It's just kind of a, a secondhand identification with being the people of God. And then it gets down to another level of identification where it says, well, you know, I wear, you know, uh, I, what, what did it say? It says, I write the Lord's name on my hand, and I, I take the name of Israel as my own, so my kids have biblical names, and, you know, it seems like it's another level of de detraction. And, and the only reason I bring it up is because I think as we want to live and not just exist, we have to have a, a high level of identity with the Lord. So consider your level of identity with the Lord. Maybe I can just gauge it as, how obnoxious are you about Jesus? Right? I'm saying get obnoxious. Right? The fact that God exists, that I have a relationship with Him through Jesus Christ. And it's a hard thing to relate to. I guess you have to kind of grow into that. But it's a good thing to say, you know what? I know why I'm here. I know what life is all about. Joshua 24, couldn't help but think about that one. That was where Joshua is bringing the people into the promised land, and he's trying to get them to make a commitment. Don't be this kind of Christian over here. Consider, right? Choose this day who you're going to serve. It says in Joshua 24, 14, So fear the Lord and serve Him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols your ancestors worshipped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt, serve the Lord alone. That's a challenge. 
to a high level, a high level of consciousness that, hey, you left a place where you were bending the knee to made up gods. Now's the time for you to reassert yourself. And there's that term again, idols, right? We're in chapter 44 talking about the foolish stupidity of making a god of your own design. And what does it look like? It says in the scripture, right? Human beauty, a human form. They stuff it in a, uh, a shrine and they, they bow down before it. And they never consider. Isn't it interesting that those questions are asked? They never stop to think. But you need to stop and think because idol production is still in the works. Do any of you struggle with idol production? Are you creating things in your life that you look to for the extreme and ultimate security? What is it that makes you feel most secure? I was thinking this week, you know, what is it that you love the most? Is that your idol? That's a scary thing to put. I thought about put, putting that out on the board. Whatever you love the most is your idol. And people will say, well, I love my kids. How can that be wrong? I love my mom and dad. How can that be wrong? But the distinction there is what you love the most. I actually had a conversation with a non-believer, and I shared my sermon ideas with good friends that may not be believers, and, and I was able to share with them, you know, the, that extreme thought where Jesus says, you better hate your mother and father comparatively to what you think of me. People left Jesus at that point. They're like, whoa, I gotta love you more than my mom and dad? They were ready to bail, but when it comes down to it, who gave you your mother and father? Who gave you your children? Right? What God has given you as gifts doesn't mean that you should elevate that gift to a level higher than the gift giver. And, you know, it seemed to make sense to the guy I was talking to. Should you love the gift more than the gift giver? That's foolishness. That's idolatry. Know who gave you the good things that you have. And live on a plane of consciousness that, boy, I belong to him. That's my God. Consider your level of identity with the Lord. And then let the creator define why you're here. That's the third point on your explorer sheet. Let him define why you're here. And I think, you know, in verse 6, back to uh, Isaiah, it says, uh, this is what the Lord says. Israel's king and redeemer, the Lord of heaven's armies, I am the first and the last. There is no other God. What is God getting, you know, what's his whole point? And he keeps talking about that. There is no other God. Isn't that trying to get you to the point of realizing you've got no other option? There is one door to pass through. That is the only way, uh, that is the only God. You have no other options. And he, he kind of talks back to him. Who is like me? Who do you have that could stand that is an option other than me? It says, let him step forward and prove to you his power. It's kind of shameful, right, that God has to remind them that whatever you think can help you isn't going to help you the way I can. And I guarantee somebody here, maybe you, probably me, is relying on something other than God. And I know we have all things and resources. We, we look to things to help us. But at the, the basic level, who is it that sustains us? As we wring our hands in fear and uncertainty in the future, what is it that sustains us? God is saying, who better than me? Can you let me do that? Can you lean on me? Isaiah 43, we just came back from that. He says in verse 10, You're my witnesses, says the Lord. You're my servant. You have been chosen to know me, believe in me, and understand that I alone am God. So letting the Creator define why you're here, God told Israel, Hey, I gave you special insight into your Creator with the sole purpose is to let the others know that you know the God in control. And God has given you that privilege as well. I know it's hard, you know, to hear your pastor keep kind of hammering that idea that really, how will the world know that there is a God they can trust in? It has to be the way we speak about Him. 
It has to be the way we live our own lives. So it's again one, a challenge of, am I going to show the world that there's one God and, and nothing else, no idol can stand in his place? So Matthew 28, why don't you turn to Matthew 28, so, you know, Matthew 28 is those marching orders. Our mission, verse 16 through 20, he's speaking to the 11 disciples. It says that the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. This is verse 16. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Imagine that, right? Everything they had seen. It's a battle. A battle of faith. Maybe you're doubting. Maybe you're struggling. Maybe you're floundering with who you should be looking to to help you in life. But then Jesus came. Boy, wouldn't that be nice to see him in, in the flesh. Someday we will, right? Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples. Make them of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Boy, those are some words of comfort, right? And some words of, of what we're to be. We're to be disciples of Jesus Christ, and we're to help others to discover the joys of being a disciple of Christ as well. And what does that involve? Teaching them all the commands that he's given us. I think sometimes we overcomplicate things. And in the process of maybe finding an easier way, or a way that won't make me stand out as a weirdo or something, that we, uh, in the process, we begin to embrace or formulate our own idols. And that's to go back to Isaiah, 44, really 9 through 20 is a section I'm just going to slide through, but, but really it is foolishness to look to something else in this world to, uh, to really be our all in all. It says at the end of verse 9, the people who worship idols don't know this, so they're all put to shame. Right? Imagine... Uh, the shame that will occur when someone finally stands before the Lord and having ignored and avoided him their whole life. Verse 18 says, such is stupidity and ignorance. Their eyes are closed, they cannot see, their minds are shut, and they cannot think. The person who made their, the idols never stops to reflect, why is just a block of wood? Willful ignorance is just plain stupid. That's the fourth point on your explorer sheet. Willful ignorance is just plain stupid. I love when I can get to a point in my relationship with non-believers that I can be blunt with them. I love to be able to say, man, you really think everything came from nothing? What if God is real? Are you going to be in trouble? Have you considered the evidence for the Christian faith. You know what I mean. Drop in some of those hints of you might be missing something. People need that. People need to be challenged. Because, once again, they're operating on this plane of thinking that is based solely on their flesh. And you can do that, right? Actually, let's go to Romans 7. I didn't write that down, but I, as I was thinking about this sense of operating on a subconscious level, then we'll, we'll have to come to an end pretty quick here. The trouble is with me. 
For I am all too human and a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself. For I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. And I know not that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what's right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I, I'm not really doing I'm not really the one doing wrong. It's sin living in me that does it. Right? You see that kind of, there's like a, an empty life that I could be living. And Paul's here saying, I'm living that life. He says, I've discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war within my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. So what's Paul's answer? Make sure you identify that you belong to him. He's the only hope you have. It's in him that I have life. You're never going to wake up if you think that just existing is the best life has to offer. I'm here today to tell you that a life in Christ is way better than you could imagine. It's not going to take all your problems away. But it's going to bring to uh, it's going to bring everything together a sense, an understanding of why you exist, where you came from, how valued you are, where you're going to end up. Those things really can bring life into perspective. And I like what it says in verse uh, 22 of Isaiah. And here, you know, he's saying in verse 21, "Pay attention, O Jacob, for you're my servant, O Israel." I, the Lord, made you, and I will not forget you. And then he shares it. I've swept away your sins like a cloud. Right? All the things that got you into exile, into Babylon, they're going to be gone. And he says, I've scattered your offenses like a morning mist. Just like the forgiveness of Christ has taken your sin as far as the east is from the west. It's been wiped out. The only thing left, he says, oh, return to me. For I have paid the price to set you free. Jesus' call to you today is the same thing. Come back to me. Give up your idols. Give up the things that you rely on. Because in the end, you're not going to find what you're looking for. I love uh, when I, I heard a commentary once on Matthew 4 when Jesus was being tempted by Satan. It says in uh, Matthew 4, 1, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. As we're tempted, right? For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. And during that time, the devil came and said to him, right? In his weakest moment, just as he'll come in our weakest moment, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. He's challenging Jesus. Use that power you have do what I tell you, and you'll have the bread you need. And Jesus does what we're to do, that we can do through the power of our spirit. He says, no, people don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Here, God is saying, yeah, I could exist on bread. I could live by eating, but there's a higher plane of life. And comes not from the things of this world, but it comes from the Lord God. His word is the bread that you want. And I think that's the message that Isaiah is trying to bring to the people. Make sure you go to him, or you're just going to exist. And that's the challenge we have, right? As we come to each day in our life, 
to know that you know when we're walking with him, we have his resources. And, and if you go back and look at Isaiah at the end of it, he's saying, hey, I'm going to expose these false prophets as the liars they are. I'm going to make fools of the fortune tellers. And I cause the wise to give bad advice. Right? He trips you up if you're not one of his. You don't have his resources. You're going to fail. Then he, he reminds them that, hey, what I say will happen. If I say to the river, dry up, it's going to dry up. And, and then he reveals to them that, hey, I'm sending someone. Sad as it may sound, I'm sending you a pagan king by the name of Cyrus. He's going to be my instrument. He's going to bring you back. The barriers you thought there were, I'll take care of them. That last point on your uh, scribe sheet, that fifth point is your life started with him, return to him today. That's a daily task, right? And then the sixth point is there is one that controls your barriers to life. So whatever stands in your way to having a greater existence, a greater purpose, a greater happiness, a greater joy, God is saying those barriers can't stay in my way. And he shares with them, right? I have a plan to get you out of Babylon and back into Jerusalem. And God has a plan for you. I love the psalmist, and I'll end with that. We have all this good food to eat. Hope you're saying. But uh, Psalm 37. Let's go to that, and I'll read it, and then we'll close in order of prayer. Psalm 37. And I guess this is the challenge, right? We see people thriving, following their you know bliss or whatever you want to call it. Their idols are shiny and attractive, and boy, I wouldn't mind having one of those. Psalm, the psalmist says in verse 1, don't worry about the wicked or envy those who do wrong. It might seem like they got it all together, right? But the psalmist says, for like grass, they're soon going to fade away. Like spring flowers, they're soon going to wither. Trust in the Lord and do good. And then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. In verse 5 and 6, boy, I love it. It says, commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him, and he will help you. He will make your innocence radiate like the dawn, and the justice of your cause will shine like the noonday sun. Be still in the presence of the Lord, and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. That is what it means to live. So let us uh, revel in that. Lord God, we are grateful that we could get excited about your word today. To get excited about the fact that I'm yours. That I belong to you. And uh, by keeping that as my primary uh, purpose and meaning in life, I don't lose sight of the fact that you're the one who meets me. You're the one who has resources that can help me get over it, any barrier in my own life. And it's just foolish to look to the things of the world, to look to the idols of others, to bring us meaning and comfort and strength. I want to get all those things from you, and I pray for those here today, that they see you as that, that bottomless uh, uh, well of, of resources that we can draw upon. And we ask that we do that each day in Jesus' name.